good morning again. Thank you guys for joining us. I am very excited to get into the Word, and we've been going through our uh, Acts series. So today we're going to continue, and we're going to be in Acts chapter 15. But before we get to Acts chapter 15, I want to take you to John chapter 3, verse 16, okay? John chapter 3, verse 16. This is uh, the most famous verse in the Bible. Everybody knows this one. Uh, you know, as it used to be at every football game, you'd inevitably see somebody with a poster that said John 3.16. Of course, we're still uh, we're still um, excited that the Buccaneers are Super Bowl champions. Amen. <laughs> uh, OK, John 3.16. And uh, this is this is an incredible passage of scripture. We know how it begins where Jesus is having this interaction with Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. And for us to understand what that means, Israel was a theocracy. And as is, you know, America is like a democratic republic, or as it's commonly referred to, a democracy. Um, so a theocracy is a government that's essentially controlled by the state religion, okay? So, of course, in Israel, during the time of Jesus, the, the religion was Judaism. Uh, so Israel, the, the kind of political scene was really an, an appendage or an extension of the religious element of society. So you had the Pharisees were really a political ruling class, uh, and then they would kind of, you know, have... Uh, you know, elections, so to speak. And at different times, the Pharisees would be in power. At other times, the Sadducees would be in power. The difference between the Pharisees and the Sadducees is that the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. Uh, they also didn't believe in angels and other kind of uh, elements of, a, of the spiritual realm that, of course, we know does exist. Are you with me? Uh, one Probably the most famous Pharisee is the Apostle Paul. Paul was trained as a Pharisee and was uh, under the tutelage of a man named Gamaliel, who uh, essentially was like a school teacher and a rabbi. And Paul was being raised up. And it says he says of himself, he's like, listen, I was more zealous than the rest of my peers. Uh, you could argue that Paul maybe was trying to, uh, I guess, be groomed to be high priest. So you have Nicodemus, who's a Pharisee, who we know about. And Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. And uh, of course, uh, we know, you know, why would why would he come at night? Well, he's probably embarrassed or was trying to uh, do it covertly. He didn't want his friends, his other Pharisee buddies, to see him talking to Jesus. So he comes under the cover of darkness. And butters Jesus up a little bit. He tries to flatter him. And then Jesus tells him, that, like, listen, he cuts to the chase. He says, to get into the kingdom of God, you got to be born again. So uh, they have this conversation. And as Jesus continues in his discourse, verse 16, it says in John 3, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. This is one of the most powerful verses in the Bible, which explains why it's probably the most well-known verse in the Bible. And God loved the world so much that he gave his son to die for us. And you could, you could argue that the, the father's love uh, was, was so great. It, you know, every parent has the natural inclination and the natural instinct to give themselves uh, to protect their children, it, it would be, it, and it's it's almost a selfish act in one way because I don't think any parent could live with the idea of like uh, losing their child if they had a chance to save them. Are you with me? God's love was so intense and so incredible that He was willing to give what was most precious to Him. Because what's most precious to me is not my life but the life of my family. God's love is such that he gave us what was most precious. This was the hardest thing that he could possibly sacrifice for us in his son. You know, uh, it says that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That is true. 
And it's true because the Bible says it. And whatever the Bible says is true. Are you with me? Uh, John 17, Jesus says that we are sanctified by the truth and his word is truth. Truth is not subjective. Uh, there, there is no such thing as your perception of the truth. So the idea, and this has become popularized, this kind of vocabulary, uh, your truth and my truth. But that doesn't make any sense because what's true is true and what isn't true isn't true. So it doesn't matter uh, how you view it or how I view it. Truth is truth. Are you with me? Uh, one, one truth that we need to make sure that we understand and that we're convinced of is that there are only two genders. Amen. There is male and there is female and there's nothing in between. There's nothing in between. Uh, there are some medical phenomena uh, that 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 do happen, but they are so rare and so minute that uh, it's not even worth addressing in a topic in a discussion like today. Uh, the reality is is that uh, everybody's born either a man or a woman, and to try and change that, especially to expose a child uh, to something like that, is just the the definition of insanity and it's ludicrous and it's evil and it's twisted. So we have to make sure that we pay attention to words and to vocabulary because words mean something. Are you with me? Uh, you know, Jesus was the word. He was the living word. God spoke the universe into existence. And how did God reveal himself to us? Listen, uh, I love living in Florida. If you take a look at Anthony Eccles, you know, it just, this is like the perfect picture, this beautiful couple with their cranking sun and the sun is shining and there's palm trees. And don't we love living in Florida? Isn't it the center of the universe, guys? Aren't you just so fired up? The Gulf Coast, it literally does not get any better than this. Are you with me? And if you looked out, if you go outside today, it's the perfect day. And you looked around, you think, man, God is awesome. You go to the beach and you think, man, God is awesome. You look at the palm trees and the oak trees and, and all of the fauna and the flowers and the, you know, the strawberry festivals coming up. Amen. And, and you go, he's like, this is just amazing. God is awesome. But the only way to truly learn about God is through his word. It's no surprise that in what are what is called the dark ages, what, what, what made it dark? People couldn't read. They were ignorant of, of the truth. Why were they ignorant of the truth? Because they were unable to read. They were illiterate. And for, uh, the, you know, the better part of 2,000 years, uh, the, you know, the Catholic Church, for example, uh, we're not anti-anything in the movement of God. We're pro-Bible, pro-Jesus, and pro-everything the Bible says. Uh, but we call a spade a spade, and we talk about it, amen? We don't hold punches. So, uh, you know, historically, the Catholic Church would hold mass in Latin. Well, nobody spoke Latin except the priesthood. Are you with me? So then you imagine going to church and, uh, you know, the Bible's being read in a language you don't understand. And then the, the speaking is done in a language you don't understand. The singing is done in a language you don't understand. And if I tell you that this is what the Bible says and you can't go and read it for yourself because you don't read that language and you don't even read, well, then I can control you. Uh, you know, uh, slavery, uh, for example, uh, in America a couple hundred years ago, uh, one of the things that they would do is they would prevent slaves from learning how to read. Why? Because if you can learn how to read, you can go and read the Bible for yourself and realize that there's a wicked evil being propagated against you. Uh, and of course, with the slaves not being able to read, these slave masters would then read scriptures out of context where, you know, and the idea that slavery is promoted by the Bible is not true. The Bible does not promote slavery. Amen, guys. And, and just to be understood properly, the slavery that the Bible does talk about is 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 different than uh, chattel slavery, which is what was experienced, uh, for example, here in America, uh, but really all around the world where people are literally chained uh, and put on a ship and shipped to some place that they had never known. Uh, and then they read some scripture like obey your masters. And then if you have no 
means to go and study that in context and understand the whole context of the Bible, I guess you say, well, I better be a good slave then. Are you with me? And, and, you know, for me as a disciple, as a Christian, and I, I believe I can speak for the whole church here, because in our church, we only have disciples. We don't have people in our church that are not disciples. Uh, if you're not a disciple, then, you know, I, it doesn't mean that you can't fall away. If you become a disciple, you could, sadly, you could make the decision to leave God. I don't know why you would want to do that. But the Bible does say, as a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. So I don't know if you've ever seen a dog eat its own its own waste. I have. It's gross. They do it. Uh, and, and so do human beings sometimes return to their folly. Amen. We, do, we don't understand that. Uh, but as a disciple, I can speak for the whole church, for every disciple, not for our just our church in Tampa, but for our movement worldwide. I can literally speak on behalf of our movement worldwide that it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. And, and I was a slave to sin, and Jesus set me free. And one thing that I refuse to do is become a slave again. I will never be a slave again. I struggle. I fall. There's temptations. Sometimes, uh, you know, you want to sin. Sometimes you want to uh, turn away from the Lord and go back to your old life. But man, the slavery was such in my life before I became a disciple that I never want to return there. And you know, what's cool is that Satan will try and blackmail you. He'll try to tempt you. He'll try to make you feel like you can't overcome. And the, there's an escape hatch. There is a release. There's, there is a route for you to take, and it's called openness, confession, and repentance. The only thing that can keep you as a slave is remaining in the darkness when you've been in sin. And it could be an actual sin like sexual immorality or impurity drunkenness, debauchery, hatred, uh, etc., or it could be a, a sin of the heart like bitterness, uh, resentment, uh, excessive sadness and depression that you refuse to kind of shrug and shake off so that you can serve the Lord full of joy. So uh, this, is, this is super important. So you say, hey, listen, we've been set free. We have been made free. That is super important. So what, is, what does this teach us? Learning the word is super important. Reading the Bible is super important because that is how God expressed himself to us. It says in the scriptures that it is for a lack of knowledge that people perish. Are you with me? So we read John 3.16 and we find, hey, this is true. God loved the world. He gave his one and only son. Whatever, whoever believes in him shall, shall be saved and not perish. That is true. Can I get a witness? But so is every other verse in the Bible. So what we have to do is take the whole context of the scriptures. The Bible itself has a context in and of itself in its entirety. The New Testament has a context. Each book in the New Testament has a context. You know, uh, it's not often that the rest of the passage is read. We're going to do just that in verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. You know, so when you say you got to believe that's true, and it also says you've got to walk in the light. And what we find here in this word belief is, is a, a synecdoche. And that word synecdoche is a little, a little tricky. But the definition of it is, is a figure of speech in which a part is made to represent the whole or vice versa. So a synecdoche is a figure of speech in which a part is made to represent the whole. So, for example, if I said the Tampa, uh, that Tampa won the Super Bowl, do you guys know what I'm talking about? It's the Tampa Bay Buccaneers football team, right? If I say New Orleans did not win the Super Bowl, do you guys know what I'm talking about right there? It's a synecdoche. 
So you know I'm, I'm inferring something. I'm implying something. And because we're familiar with the context, we don't need further explanation. We know, oh, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers football team won. Tom Brady winning his sixth title or seventh title, whatever it is. Uh, oh, the New Orleans Saints football organization did not win. But, hey, if Drew Brees doesn't retire, maybe they'll get to the playoffs next year. You know, uh, so you say, OK. I get it now. So when Jesus says you got to believe, he's not saying that you, you know, merely an intellectual assent to say, oh, I believe means I'm saying you got to do something about it. How do I know? Well, look at John chapter eight, verse 31. This is the same gospel. This is the same Jesus. Only five chapters later in verse 31, he says, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, you have done enough and now you are saved. What? It doesn't say that. What does it say? It says to the Jews who had believed him. Well, we got to assume because John 3, 16 says whoever believes is saved. So then they're saved. So we should just close the Bible. The church is over, guys. Everybody's saved because you believe. No, no, no. Okay, let's read it. What does it say? If you hold to my teaching, that word if makes it completely conditional, contingent upon what comes next. If you hold to the teachings, if you obey the teachings, then you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So this is crucial. What would we be set free from? Well, verse 33 says, they answered him, we are Abraham's descendants. We have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Verse 34, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. So belief by itself is not enough. In John 3, 16, he's using a figure of speech to encompass everything that was to come with one who has true faith. One who has true faith, when they hear the word of God, they believe it, they accept it as such. Then they repent, they confess, and they're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and then their sins are forgiven, and they're saved. I was expecting something right there, like a, like an amen right there, amen. So we've got to put the scriptures in context. There's another scripture I want to show you in Romans 3.16. Romans, not Romans 3.16, Romans 3.23, excuse me. Romans 3.23, this is important. It says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. It says, listen, there's no difference. Everybody has sinned. Everybody has sinned. You have sinned and I have sinned. We are all, you know, as Corey told us in the welcome, we're all a little crooked. We're all a little deformed in one way because of sin. Amen. Uh, sin always takes you further than you want to go. It costs more than you want to pay and it keeps you longer than you wanted to stay. Uh, you know, and it says, hey, we've all sinned, but it's through faith in the blood of Jesus that we can receive the atonement, the expiation of our sins. Are you with me? So when we sinned, we, we fell into debt with God. We owed God an insurmountable debt, something, an amount we would never, it, it's a ludicrous amount, kind of like the uh, American economy right now is like $30 trillion in the hole. It's like, that's never going to get paid off. You know, they can keep printing checks. Hey, and if they print stimulus checks and they want to send it to disciples, we already know what's going down. We're going to give it to missions. Amen. It's just like, hey, it's manna from heaven. They're like, oh, man. You know, it's like, thank you, Lord. Uh, of course, if you're unemployed, you got to keep it. Make sure you pay your bills. Amen? Pay your bills. But then give to the Lord. Give to the Lord, then pay your bills. You get it. Uh, <laughs> so you say, okay, uh, well, there's this debt that I owe. And there's no way I'll be able to pay it back. And it says that Jesus wants to forgive your debt. Jesus doesn't want to only bring you to zero with God. Jesus wants to give you an inexhaustible account of grace and forgiveness. 
imagine, you know, we are really diligent in looking at our bank accounts, especially, especially when your tax return is kind of scheduled to come in. I, I look at it every morning. I'm like, where's it at, man? They told me 21 days. It's been 22. What's going on? <laughs> Uncle Sam, what are you doing? Did you sleep in? And, uh, you know, imagine opening your bank account and seeing an infinity symbol. What would you do if you just had an infinite amount of money? You just go, whatever. Uh, and, and that's what we have spiritually. God brought us not only to zero. He didn't just forgive us of our sins when we were baptized. He literally gave us blessings on top of blessings, grace in place of grace. And he deposited his Holy Spirit in our hearts. This is incredible. So you say, okay, when Jesus died and he shed his blood, does that mean that everybody was saved because he did that? Well, no, but it's now accessible for any and everybody to come and get it. Uh, similarly, you know, last year they had what was called the PPP, which was the Payroll Protection Program. And the government released a certain amount of money for small businesses that were impacted by COVID to, to come and, and get, you know, money to help them pay their employees, essentially, right? That money was made accessible, but you needed to apply and fill out various forms and then meet the qualifications to say, hey, I, I need the assistance. Of course, if you didn't need the assistance, then uh, you wouldn't qualify. Last year, we actually did qualify for some assistance uh, from the payroll protection program. Isn't that, isn't that incredible? This year, we did not qualify. Why? Because even in spite of a pandemic, the disciples increased their contribution here. We did not decrease our contribution. So to qualify, you would need to prove that you had a 25% reduction in what was coming in. And actually, the disciples have grown and we our budget has grown. Now, it needs to continue to grow so that we can put more people on staff and raise them up and train them and send them out. Are you with me? You say, but again, this is applicable because this grace was made available, but then we've got to access it and it's not according to your race that you access it are you with me uh it's not it's not it's not according to where you were born that you access it it's not according to whether or not you were jewish that you access it it is according to god's grace and our obedience to his word so so i'm gonna park it there just as far as the doctrine goes uh i would encourage you to call me I'll put my number. If somebody could just put my number in the chat, that would be awesome. Maybe my, my beautiful wife could put my number in the chat and call me. If you're visiting with us, you want to set up a Bible study, I'll point you in the right direction. I'll teach you as much as I can. Uh, and I'm super excited because Evan's been studying the Bible with the guys. And um, he, he is, he's a remarkable young man. He's actually working on his second bachelor's degree. Uh, this guy's a world changer. I hope you're inspired to see Alex Derry preach the word for contribution. Uh, you know, it was it was just a few weeks ago that Corey called his guys together, had a little bit of D time, said, you guys got to share your faith. Then Augustine got onto Snapchat. I don't know what he was doing on Snapchat. He was just looking for fish, amen? I don't even know what Snapchat is, to be honest with you. And then he saw Alex. They went to high school, and Alex said, I'm looking for a church. And Augustine said, why don't you come to my church, study the Bible, and a week later he got baptized, and today he's preaching the word. It's incredible. So, so please reach out to us. If you're visiting with us, we want you to study the Bible. We say, listen, God's grace is, is sublime. It's, in, it's infinite, and it's incredible, and it's because of his grace that we are here. Now we've got to figure out how to get it to as many people as possible. That's what this lesson's about. And the title is Central Leadership with a Central Leader. How do you get the grace to as many people as possible? You got to have a central core of leadership with a central leader. We know what Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20 says, but let's turn there and read it. How are we going to get it to as many people as possible? As disciples, we've been given the cure for cancer. We don't want to sit on it. We don't want to, you know, hoard it. 
We want to spread it. Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20. It says, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. It's so awesome to know that when you go out and you share your faith, when you are in a Bible study, when you go to Bible talk, Jesus is with you. Jesus wants to be with you. He wants to walk with you. He wants you to be with him while he's doing his work. And Jesus is still working. He's molding us. He's prodding us. There are so many people in the world that he is working on right now. He's preparing them, not only through, through uh, you know, misfortune, but also through good things that are happening. God is working in their lives, preparing them for you and for me to walk with the Lord, tap them on the shoulder, and invite them to study the Bible. So this is what it's all about. This is the Great Commission. This is what defines us as a people. Our mission in this life is to make as many disciples as possible to bring as many people to heaven with us as is humanly possible, working with the Lord. Colossians chapter 1, verse 28 says, He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. So in the church, we work with each other. We work with our friends. We work with our family. And it says that we, we labor with the energy that is given by Christ. Are you with me? And it says that this is, this is uh, our goal. We want to present everybody complete. We're never going to be perfect, but our goal is to present everybody complete. Our goal is to be made complete ourselves. Romans 15, 14, Paul says, I myself am convinced, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge, and competent to instruct one another. You know, I'm so proud of the Bible Talk leaders because they've been proven competent. They say, hey, listen, our role, our, our call as a Bible Talk leader is to be competent, to instruct one another and to preach the word to one another. Now, there's a bit of a, a, a misunderstanding there because it's not just the leaders that Paul is calling competent. Paul is talking to the whole Roman church, all of the Roman disciples, and he says, I am convinced that you are competent, that you are able. And you know what's special about our church is that we understand and believe that each and every one of us has been called to the standard of Jesus. That, that it's not the evangelist or, or, or the Bible talk leader or the shepherd or the deacon or the song leader or the web deacon or the usher that is competent, but every person who's been called to follow Jesus. Disciple is the greatest title in the land. We've been called, each and every one of us, and God has capacitated us. He's given us everything we need to get the job done. Here's my, here's my challenge for us this morning. Here's my, my little, my little, I have a little bone of contention, okay? Sometimes our confidence does not match our competence, Meaning our confidence is down here, while the Bible says we are fully competent. Our competence is up here. And I think what happens is we can get in the way and we think, oh, it's a lack of age or a lack of experience. But really, it's just sinful arrogance. It's sinful pride. God has called you competent, and you need to be humble and take him at his word. You are able, and with the Lord, you are more than able to get the job done. Well, what's the job? It's to evangelize all nations in this generation. Look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Yeah, I love what Alex said this morning. 
I'm the I'm the baby disciple, but I'm I'm just as fired up as the person that's been around the longest. I, I I'd say he's probably a little more fired up. <laughs> uh, uh, First Corinthians chapter twelve, you know, right here in verse fourteen, it says. Now, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, cease to be part of the body. You ever been around disciples, got a bad attitude? Like, I don't know, man. Maybe they show up, they give you the silent treatment at Bible talk. You know, it's like, so what do you guys think about that? Hey, bro, do you want to add anything to the study? Yeah, that was good, it's good. I don't like my disciple. <laughs> Listen, it doesn't mean that you're not a part of the body. We still love you. Amen. We've all been there too. So it says, okay, so the foot, it's still a part of the body. <laughs> and verse 16 says, and if the air should say, because I'm not, the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body. It would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of, of hearing be? So imagine just a giant eyeball with little feet. That would be odd. Uh, where would this, how could that body hear that it has no ears? This is what the Bible says, you know, there's a little bit of, of humor, I think here. Uh, it says in, in verse uh, 18, in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be as it is? There are many parts, but one body, you know, we all have quirks. We all, uh, we're a little bit idiosyncratic. You know, we've got some idiosyncrasies. Uh, we, you know, we've got some things, you know, amen. Uh, we got some weird uncles, <laughs> we, me, me, you know, you got me, uh, uh, I'm, I'm the weird uncle here. And it's like, Oh, you know, we got some wonky stuff. We got some crust. We got some, this and some, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And that's okay. You know what? God has placed everybody exactly where he wanted them to be. And each of us has the spirit and each of us plays a super significant role. Now you're going to get discipled. It doesn't give you the license to be a rogue agent and just do whatever you want because no, 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 there's, there's equality. And God says, listen, I've, I've placed you sometimes in a very challenging position. Uh, sometimes, sometimes being a disciple, it is really challenging. It challenges you emotionally, mentally, physically, uh, et cetera. Sometimes it's really awesome. Right. Uh, you know, and not everything is just a flat line in nature. There are no straight lines. Uh, our growth as a as individuals, as a church, as a movement, it's kind of like a, a bit of a bumpy road, but it's always going upwards. Are you with me? Uh, so you say, OK, well, let's read on here and find out what it says. In verse 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. The head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. What this calls for is humility. What are we talking about? How are we going to get the sublime grace of God to as many people as possible? Humility. We need each other. Now, we get a little bit fearful that, that if we give that level of trust to somebody, then we could get abused, right? Maybe I'll have to listen to them, but they're not going to listen to me. And it's not going to be, it's not going to be mutual. But the Bible calls us to mutual edification and to total unity. Not, not unity on uh, opinions. Unity, we've got to not agree to disagree, but we've got to come to terms with what the scriptures teach and say, you know what? At the end of the day, my opinion is not all that important and everybody's got them. We just need to make sure that we are totally unified with the scriptures. If we're unified with the Lord, we're unified with what the Bible teaches, we ourselves will be unified also. Can I get an amen? Verse 22, on the contrary, those parts of the body that seem weaker are indispensable. Indispensable. It says that the only people that we cannot dispense with are the weak ones. You know, as a church builder, uh, I, I, I love when disciples are doing great. I love when disciples are really strong. But sometimes we're not. Sometimes we're weak. It says the weaker ones, those are the ones you need to hold on to. You know, we're going to send some uh, people out on a mission team very soon by june we sent victoria last year are you with me and really just get ready because one or, or two people is not that much i mean we send our best but the people that we we 
we cannot send our, our weak people. Not because, you know, they're weak and they're going to tank the mission team. No, because they are actually the ones that are indispensable to the growth here. So, you know, you got to look at your Bible talk and you got to look at your, your surroundings and look at your brothers and sisters and say, hey, we need each other. We are important. You are important. What you do means something. In verse 23, it says, and the parts we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. The parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Right there, Paul says, listen, and this is for us this morning. You are the body of Christ. When we come together on a Sunday morning, we are the body of Christ. And, you know, the singing could be out of pitch. Doesn't matter. We are the body of Christ. You might have had a funky week. Doesn't matter. We are the body of Christ. And God is elevating our vision here and showing us who we really are. God has called us to greatness. He's called us to total unity. He said, listen, whoever's lacking, I'm going to give extra love to so that they can be on par so that there will be no division among you. God doesn't want any division. He wants us all to be on the same snap count, to be on the same page, to be tuned in to the same channel. We are family. And that is how you get the sublime grace to as many people as possible. You know, in Acts chapter 15, there's this issue. And the issue was that some people thought, they were called the Judaizers, that you needed to be Jewish to be saved. So if you had somebody that was not Jewish, they would say, you have to get circumcised and obey the law of Moses to be saved. And Paul, of course, says, no, you don't. Uh, Peter echoes that statement. But what's really incredible is that it's James that stands up. This is James, the half-brother of Jesus, who wrote the epistle uh, entitled James. Now he's the half-brother of Jesus because he was born of uh, Mary and Joseph, while Jesus was, of course, the Son of God, born to the Virgin Mary. Uh, one false teaching in the world, uh, specifically in Catholicism, is the perpetual virginity of Mary, meaning that after she gave birth to Jesus, uh, she never consummated her marriage with Joseph, and she never had any further children. Uh, but there are uh, a plethora of scriptures that prove otherwise, uh, one of which being, of course, uh, denoting that James was Jesus' half-brother because he was born to both Joseph and and Mary. So it's James in the in the company of Paul and Peter who stands up being the leader of the church in Jerusalem and then makes a final decision about the issue saying listen the gentiles do not need to be circumcised they do not need to become jewish so to speak to be saved. And when he stands up and makes that decision that's a binding decision not only in Jerusalem where he leads the local church but it's a binding decision for the whole first century movement, which we learned last week was already starting to extend into uh, what is uh, Western Asia, modern day Turkey, and then on into Europe. Paul's ultimate goal was to get to Rome. It was also spreading East and South and, and the whole known world was evangelized in their generation. So to have the greatest impact, we need to have central leadership with a central leader. James being proven the central leader who made a binding decision. It's similar to when a family wants to uh, go out to eat. We are now experiencing this. Our children are getting a little bit older and have opinions. And mom and, and Chloe, they flat out love Chick-fil-A. If they ate Chick-fil-A for the rest of their lives, they would be happy. Daddy and Priscilla, I think I'd just rather get a McDouble. It's a little more on the affordable side. I'm good. Uh, I'm happy. Plus, they got the big cranking uh, Diet Cokes for a dollar at McDonald's. I like that. You know, you get a large for a buck. Uh, and, and, and then, you know, you say, hey, where should we go to eat? And it's like you get 
a, four different opinions. And ultimately, it's uh, what I've learned in parenting is that it's a bad idea to give the option. You just got to make a decision. Amen. So this is this is what it looks like to have leadership. Now, we've got to understand that being a disciple is being a leader, that following Jesus, the greatest leader that ever existed, we are called also to be a leader. And I want to understand, I want us to understand this morning that the strategy that Jesus gives us in his in his uh, ministry that we see in the gospels, it works. Small groups work, discipling works, prayer works. Sometimes we're not seeing the same results. And I think there are two things that that are lacking. The the faith has got to be there, but also the the effort has got to be there. The force has got to be there. And we all know how to make disciples, which is incredible. Even the youngest among us. That's what's different in our church. You go to the religious world and you got like the, the basically, you know, the guy who has a, a, a degree from a seminary is presumed or assumed to know what he's doing. Uh, whereas, a, you know, honestly, a degree doesn't really mean that you know how to make a disciple. Jesus did not have a degree uh, from the synagogue, uh, nor did any of his apostles. His apostles are actually called unschooled and ordinary. These were the men that turned the world upside down. John, in his gospel, the New Testament was written in Greek, wrote the, the gospel of John in what is considered to be the highest form of Koine Greek known at that time. He was educated not in a, in, a, in a normative institute, but he was educated by walking with Jesus. And walking with Jesus gives you an education. Now, we have the conviction, biblically, that if you are a student, you need to be an excellent student. You need to finish your studies and you got to get your degree. Amen? Uh, or if you are in a, a trade school, you got to crank it out. There's actually millions of really high-paying jobs uh, that are trade jobs or uh, technical jobs, such as HVAC air conditioning, uh, welding, et cetera. But these guys have an education by walking with Jesus. So we got to look at Jesus' strategy and simply apply more force, apply more faith and apply more force. And you're going to have the same results. It's, it's Bible effort that produces and yields Bible results. Discipling works, guys. Look at Titus chapter 2, verse 15. Titus chapter 2, verse 15, simply says, These then are the things you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. If all you do is rebuke people, you will be despised. If all you do is encourage people, you will be despised. I said last week, you know, the best coaches I ever had in baseball did both. Uh, it was not all encouragement. Nobody wants to be on a team where the coach says, hey, guys, it doesn't matter if we win. You know, we're, we're just we're just here to have fun. It's like, I don't want to be on that team. Why? I want to win. That's why I play. Are you with me? Uh, you, you want you want to be encouraged. You want to be believed in, but you also want to know how to play the game. Uh, and, and I had some tough coaches. I've had some tough teachers. Those are the ones you remember. I'll never forget Mr. Kajaka. Oh, baby. Uh, I was a tough kid, and I would bowl over my teachers in middle school. With Mr. Jacob, I met my match. And even though I never really fully outwardly complied, in my heart, I admired him, respected him, and I still remember what I learned in his class in eighth grade. I want to encourage us that when we reach out to people this week, that, that, that they meet their match. When you sit down to study the Bible with somebody, they say, wow, I think I met my match. They're going to admire you. They're going to love you. It's, it's so much better to be loved than to be liked. If you don't challenge anybody, you'll be liked, but you won't be loved. And here he says, you know what? You got to encourage and rebuke. And discipling is a little daunting because if I disciple you, if I teach you something, train you in something, call you to something, that then makes me vulnerable. Because then you could say, well, you're a bad example here and here and here. Are you with me? That's why we sometimes we we pull back. Are you with me? But there's got to be like what we call a, a, re, a rebuke sandwich. So it's like encouragement, rebuke, encouragement, and that's a good 
counseling time or discipling time. Like, bro, I just think you're so amazing. You're so talented. You're tall, dark, and handsome. But bro, right here, you really stink in this area, okay? You, you're stinking it up. But bro, I know you can do it. You're so amazing. God loves you. I love you. Everybody loves you. That's encouraging, but also convicting. Are you with me? So this week, we're going to practice a rebuke sandwich. But we don't just practice it with each other. Go out into the world. Go to your community. The way to do that is go to Walmart, go to Publix, go to the Home Depot, go to wherever there are people that live near you and give them a rebuke sandwich. Now they've got to accept that from you. It's like an invitation to lunch. Hey, I'd like to have coffee. Now if you say, hey, I'd like to give you a rebuke sandwich, that's probably not going to go so well. Uh, so you might need to package it. Hey, I'd like to have coffee with you. And, and uh, do a Bible study with you. Jesus discipled people that had yet begun to follow him, that had yet to begin to follow him, something like that. He discipled Nicodemus, even though Nicodemus was yet to be his disciple. Are you with me? Why? Jesus's confidence matched his competence. And that doesn't mean that Jesus walked around without the temptation to lack confidence or the temptation to be insecure. He just denied that temptation because it's pride and arrogance because that temptation is a refusal. If you give in to, to take God's word for it, God says that you are competent. Don't be afraid of making mistakes, brothers and sisters. You know, Adam ate the forbidden fruit. Noah got drunk. Abraham lied on multiple occasions. Jacob deceived many times. Moses killed someone and buried the body in the desert. Rahab was a prostitute. David committed adultery and had the husband of his mistress assassinated. Jonah ran away. Thomas doubted. Peter sold Jesus out. Paul killed Christians. We sinned, but Jesus redeems. Don't be afraid. Be bold. Be brave. Be courageous. Love each other deeply from the heart. You know, as we close out, I want to look at one verse in Luke chapter 6, verse 40. This really tells us what we're all about here. In Luke 6, verse 40, Jesus says, A student is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. We're all being trained. Uh, we are all being taught. We are all learning. We're learning from God himself when we get into his word and have quiet times and through the disciplines and challenges of life. But we also have people in our lives that are trying their best to show us our blinds, our blind spots. Some of us are a little easier to disciple than others. Amen. Uh, it is a noble ambition to be what is called user friendly, uh, to, to be easily uh, discipleable, easily taught to be teachable. Are you with me? That is a noble ambition. And, and we need to pursue that to say, listen, I want to be, hey, how do you do that? You show up and say, Hey, here's the good thing. Here's the bad thing. Here's the ugly thing. And here's my plan. Now you might get disciples and say, that's a bad plan. Do this plan instead of that, instead of that plan. And then you walk away, you say, wow, I'm encouraged uh, because I just got some training and some discipling. I want to leave you with a few quotes about learning and training. Benjamin Franklin says, tell me and I forget. Teach me, I may remember. Involve me and I learn. In God's church, everybody's involved. Everybody. Pablo Picasso says, I'm always doing that which I cannot do in order that I may learn how to do it. We're called to greatness. We're called to do things that we may not be experts at, but in that process of doing it, we will learn how to do it. You know, uh, Gandhi, I love this, says, live as if you were to die tomorrow. Learn as if you were to live forever. Uh, you know, as we uh, pick up new hobbies and do different things and try to uh, expand our, our lives and our horizons to glorify God, 
you can, I think this is a, a, a sin of us disciples sometimes. We are so radically focused and narrowly focused on the mission that sometimes we can forget to kind of expand our influence and our ability to relate to a, a multitude of people. Like if you want to learn guitar. And as I get a little older this year, I turned 36. Yes, yes, that's right. I, I just let the cat out of the bag. Uh, I can start to feel like I don't have any more time. I can't waste time learning guitar. I got to evangelize the world. This is true. You do need to evangelize the world. But you know what happens? Instead of learning guitar, you start scrolling Facebook. And uh, I don't want, I don't have any stats in front of me about how much time we spend just zoning out and spacing out. Are you with me? Uh, but we need to curb that and invest in something that's a little, uh, uh, that there's a, a, a greater return on. B.B. King, the famous musician, said the beautiful thing about learning is that nobody can take it away from you. Isn't that awesome? Uh, Henry Ford says the only thing worse than training your employees and having them leave is not training them and having them stay. I thought that this was perfect. What are we doing? We don't have employees in God's church. We're a family. But we're training up our sons and daughters. We're training up our brothers and sisters. Not, not to keep them, but to send them. But you know, when you've trained them and you send them, it hurts. It's hard. It's like, oh man, I don't want to send that. You know, this is, this is, we need to, we need to take care of the local church, but it's better to train them and send them than to not train them and keep them. Are you with me? Uh, you know, I love what Michael Williamson said, our, the world sector leader of Europe. You're not sold out unless you're sent out. And we're going to do some sending this year. Amen. Uh, Winston Churchill, my secular hero says learning experiences are like journeys. The journey starts where the learning is now and ends where the learner is more successful. The end of the journey isn't knowing more, it's doing more. The Bible talk leaders are being raised up not to know more, but to do more. All of us are being raised up, not necessarily to know more, although that comes with the territory, but to apply that knowledge to a greater efficiency. Are you with me? There are very few people. I mean, I, I believe that everybody should have the ambition to be a Bible talk leader. I literally, the day that Marlene and Christine are leading Bible talk again, I'm flat going to throw a party in my house, basically with myself, because, you know, COVID, I don't want everybody coming over. Uh, <laughs> but I'm going to have a cake with some candles. That, you know, we got to grow the church. We have, the, we need to use the resources that God has given us. Have you ever heard Marley teach the Bible? But it's not about what we know. It's about what we do. So we've got to do first. We've got to make disciples. We've got to grow the church. Are you with me right there? Okay, amen. John Bright, who was a British statesman, says training and development. The best development programs change the way people see themselves. This is crucial. You've got to see yourself in a different light. You've got to see this morning. You've got to understand Romans 15, 14. You are competent. You are competent to teach. You are competent to preach. You are competent to make disciples and to baptize them. Consider yourself ordained. You are sent, not by some man but by Jesus Christ himself. And you've been made competent. You know, what's incredible is that God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. The call has been made. The, qualif the qualifying is now happening. But our confidence has got to match our competence. You know, Jesse Owens, the famous Olympian, says the battles that count aren't the ones for gold medals. The struggles within yourself, the invisible, inevitable battles inside all of us, that is where it's at. The invisible, inevitable battles of Monday morning, that's what counts. If you win that battle, when you are called to greatness, to the world stage, as Jesse Owens was, 
you will be successful. The Bible does say that God gives success to the upright. We're not talking about how to become a better, a better version of you. We're talking about how to live out a better version of Jesus than we've done before. Jesus wants us to become like him. Jesus was successful. What was his greatest success? Uh, he overcame death. He never sinned, then he died, and then he resurrected. Amen? He raised again. Finally, from an unknown source, you've got to hustle for the muscle. And to God be the glory. 